Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back, and it is Thursday. As you probably noticed, Miss Liz was not online at 3 p.m. because that tea time is rescheduled, and we are sending our prayers and thoughts with Gail and Gregory as they are going through the California fires right now. So we are rescheduling that tea time for in the future. There has been no date set yet. We're making sure that everything is fine and dandy with them over there and they're safe first before we set that date up. So tonight I have the incredible Matt. My Tria in the house, and she's going to be speaking about spirituality, yoga. Um, we're going to get into some childhood mysteries and a lot of uh, feminine mystic, mystic, mysterious systems. I hope I'm saying it right. If not, I'm going to get her to say it. We're going to get into a lot of different things. So if you have any questions or comments or anything, please leave them in the section. Uh, and please know that Miss Liz will get them out there if they resonate with the conversation. But before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Ring that little doorbell and you can watch these tea times at any time. Uh, if you'd like to listen to the audio, check out Miss Liz's podcast. Uh, I, I'm on multiple podcast apps as well. So let me give you a little bit of disclaimer and bio on my incredible guest who's waiting in the studio. And then we're going to have a good old tea tonight. And tonight's tea is teaching eternal awakening. So grab your tea, grab your juice, grab your water. You do not need to drink tea on Tea Time with Miss Liz. And let's get started. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that this show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows originally are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If it's done on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a rescheduled tea time, a returning guests or a surprise or special tea time that Miss Liz wants to get out there. So now a little bit on my guest who's waiting in the back in the studio. Matria Mad Nolan, PhD, is an award-winning author, spiritual teacher, and a psych psychologist, renowned for her expertise in consciousness and holistic healing. With a wealth of knowledge in both psychology and spirituality, Matria Mad Nolan works has touched the lives of many, earning her global recognition as a respected voice for inner transform transformation. As a spiritual mentor, Matria Magnolin offers Baba talks, teaches classes, and guides students on their spiritual journey. She hosts webinars, retreats, and seminars that provide spaces for individuals to connect with and experience the divine. So let me get... And Matria in here and let's spill some tea together and see where this tea takes us tonight uh where oh there she is let me get her in here welcome Matria. thank you it thank is you. an honor to have you here uh and like i said before we went live i'm like on a spiritual transformation this year since i turned 50 and i really enjoy having conversations with the, the divine and getting to know it a little bit more. So I'm honored to have you here tonight. Wonderful. I'm delighted to be here. So Matria, 
I love the tea time idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, the tea time is a metaphor, right? It's the metaphor of the past, the present, and the future. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to take you on a journey through your eyes and your tea of teaching uh, eternal awakening. We're going to talk a lot about that tea tonight. So I want to take you back until you were a little girl. Who were you as a little girl and who are you now as a grown woman? Well, when I was a little girl, I lived in a suburb of Chicago. And um, at, when I was very young, I lived on a, a sort of a mini farm, a five acre farm. And I, I very much connected with animals and trees and the natural world and uh, had my intuitive connection to divine source that manifested in my life over time and I felt this presence. And so that was that was who I was as a little girl, kind of a little sort of wild girl who spent a lot of time in nature. And um, as I am life <laughs> and uh, my life has been dedicated to connecting with, and feeling the source of deep love and beauty and uh, divine, the consciousness, the awareness, the love, which is the transcendent glue of the universe. And to be able to experience that and experience sort of the depth of everything that is, and to share that with others as much as I can has been my journey that I think has settled in now at this stage of my life. So Maitreya, how old were you when you got into the divine? When when I got into, I was young. I was probably, well, <clears throat> I always had this connection with nature and I was, when I was little, you know, under five, running around in nature a lot and feeling very connected to animals and very connected to just the natural world. And then when I was about, must have been about 11 or 12, I started feeling this um, presence that would come. <clears throat> I, you know, I would feel like a God presence a, 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 of a divine being who is so holy. Um, and and I, I just felt this presence would come around me. It was very healing. And uh, I felt I would I would go on light on walks, you know, at, uh, at night in the moonlight and sit on the porch and feel this sort of presence next to me, this sort of ephemeral being who felt like a, like Jesus or or some holy master, you know. It felt like and it felt like I had had some that I'd known this being before. Um, even though, you know, I was growing up in a situation where there was no concept of reincarnation, but I felt I had lived in another time and another place and I had known this holy being. And so it was a, a powerful sense of presence of divine being. At the time, I thought it must be Jesus because I had never ever heard of any other being like that, you know, um, and it, it yeah, I was somewhat young when it happened in my life. But then I, I turned from that, you know, that was something that happened for some years. And then I got into, uh, I would say the <clears throat> mid teens or the early teens where I really, you know, did what every kid does. I wanted to make friends and be out there and have boyfriends and, you know, do all that stuff. And so I forgot my spiritual friend and I forgot my spiritual connection. And I, I did what girls do as teenagers and made my friends and had boyfriends and, and then looked around at churches and became disillusioned, you know, and, and I think I, I looked at, I remember sitting in a church looking in the, songbook and feeling in the church and feeling it empty and feeling like there was nothing there and and um, just giving up on the idea of God, you know. So I think I 
went through a lot of this early on and uh, and then it moved on from there. So Matria, I want to get into the spiritual friend and connection because we, we all have one, right? When we're connected to the divine universe. Uh, and we don't talk about that enough. A lot of people might call it imaginary friend, a, a, you know, a source, a, a source that you speak to, you know, when you out speak uh, to yourself. Um, but we all have that spiritual connection and friend within ourselves when we're truly in the divine, correct? Right. Um, we, we experience it in different ways. You know, you can experience it as a universal uh, consciousness, universal God presence, and you feel like this vast, which I experienced later, this vast universal uh, uh, beingness that, you know, where you just, everything just melts together and you just, you know, and, and you're in the one, right? Just it's just the one, but there's also the personal element to that. So the the divine, I think, manifests in different ways. Sometimes in this more impersonal uh, cosmic consciousness, which you just sort of melt into the one, and sometimes in a personal form. Of, uh, and they say that you know the the guru, the guru is the you know the the embodiment of divine presence. Um, we sometimes think of a guru as a physical person, but that divine presence may embody in a physical person, but it also can embody in an inner guide or inner teacher or inner, inner manifestation of the God consciousness, especially, you know, if the third eye awakens, they say so the, the divine guide, the inner guru, uh, comes to you and you feel that holy presence and um, and it manifests in something in a form that is congenial to you that you can relate to because it's a little hard to relate to the cosmos sometimes you know so well, there's a lot in the cosmos right it gets overwhelming it's like you know when you see too many of one thing you're like where do I go first right it's like picking berries right and you have yeah. a field of berries you don't know what berry to pick so you it, you you get drawn to that one single berry and you're like that's got to be the first one i pick and then the second and the third um yeah and so you you know and it's i don't know if it's as much our choice as the choice of the divine to embody for us in a particular way at a particular time in our lives and it can change but but the the god consciousness the the larger unitary whole com manifests in congenial form for us to for our psyches to relate our our um that's my feeling anyway that there's really this presence and i think a lot of us have connection with that presence and we may we may feel it as just a presence or we may like have an inner dialogue like consciousness with god kind of thing or conversations with god kind of thing you know where we have an inner dialogue or we we just feel it coming in circumstances in our life and synchronicities and and things that are going on but we feel that there is this god presence with us that's guiding our lives and and is um having a direct impact on your life and and when you feel that there's a kind of magic to life you know it 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 makes my more alive, more magical, more um, vibrant, I would say. And and then that God consciousness is really in every living being. It's in every every person, every plant, every animal, you know. And when you begin to really open up to it, then you see that it's alive in front of you all the time. It never leaves you. Uh, when you look, I have a plant in front of me, a beautiful plant. I have plants behind me, I have plants all around I was going to say, you have a bunch behind you too that are gorgeous. Yeah. And so, so, you know, you look at a plant and you feel, oh, this is a living being, a breathing, living being who has its own relationship to everything and has its own way of feeling itself, being itself, right? And if you're empathic, you may blend into that feeling of that being being itself and 
and you feel, wow, there's this life force connection between us. And, and you go into the deeper stratum and you see, whoa, this is, this is, this is, this, there's no difference. This is made out of that same consciousness, that same love that is my core, my essence. And that it's just embodying in all these different forms around you. And when you do feel that, uh, life becomes much more deep and much more multidimensional and much more alive. And the, the, the divine has ways of guiding us to that. And each we each have our own unique path. Have you experienced that? that the sense of presence or that sense of guidance? Absolutely. Uh, we have a question here for you, uh, Mitri. Yeah. Why, why are we afraid of the subconscious? Well, that's a really good question. And because in the subconscious, what we call the, so we, we in Western psychology, we define that we have the conscious mind, which is what you're awake and aware of every day. Then we have the subconscious mind, which is, um, in yogic terms, that's where your karma, your uh, your reactions to past experience are stored, right? So if you've had an emotional trauma when you were young, that's going to be stored. The the not just the memory, but your reaction to that is going to be stored in your subconscious, and and we call that uh, karma. And when a karma is stored like that, it's the, the Sanskrit word for it is samskara. And the samskara is, is the reaction to a prior action, something that happened to you that you have. you And we have reaction to everything that happens to us just about, you know. But if it's traumatic or if it's a big deal, um, you know, we have quite a reaction to that. And it, we may go on in life and we kind of forget about it, but it's sitting there, right? And that's the subconscious where you have all of your karma, all of your reactions and if you believe in past lives not only to this life but to past experiences in other lives and and beneath that you have the collective unconscious uh the young refers to as a collective unconscious or the yogis refer to as the the unitary whole of being the the where the where our our connection to the god self lies and to each other and to all beings we're all connected in this collective unconscious but the in the in the karma our karma is what drives us into our distorted thinking if we didn't have any any reactions of mind our minds would be completely clear we would we would really see reality for what it is and i believe we would see our own nature and the nature of all beings as deep love deep unitary wholeness you know we would see the truth and we would be able to live in it but because different things have happened to us along the way we have our particular twist right each one of us has our own unique twist on life which is a result of our karma so depending on you know if i got burned by the stove someplace along the line. Well, I'm going to, you know, and I'm kind of nervous about fires and stoves and things like that, right? Somebody else, they're just going to walk up and use the stove. It's just a stove, right? You know, but I may have some fears around that because that happened to me. So that's, so that's the kind of thing that karma does. It, 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 it kind of forms your, um, it informs your consciousness into patterns of how you relate to things, how you react to things. And um, part of the process of enlightenment, part of the process of awakening is to, to clear that subconscious of, of um, you know, to be able to be more um, have more freedom to be really awake and aware and not be bound by these reactions to past experience that bind us into patterns 
you know, and we all have those patterns. We all have our shadow material. I, I don't know of anybody who doesn't have shadow material and doesn't have uh, difficult struggles of one kind or another in their life. This is, this is part of our human condition. But there is a freeing that can happen as we connect more with the God self, with the unitary whole of being, and we um, are able to clear some of this material <laughs> so, that, so that it isn't it's, it's so, dominating us. So, Matria, we have a comment here. It's re uh, reincarnation scars. Have you ever heard of that? Reincarnation scars. I've so never. it's almost like what you're what you're saying, right? Is the karma is leaving like little scars into our yeah. next lives? Yeah, and our whole you know, identity as an individual is called our basket of karma. All of these things, which have built up maybe lifetime upon lifetime, if you believe that, um, they build up to form your uniqueness you're a, you're a unique flower in the garden of this world of 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 this created universe each one of us is a unique flower but but we're we're caught in our uniqueness too our uniqueness can be beautiful but it's also a bondage of type because eventually we want to free ourselves to be fully whole fully connected you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Liz, but inside of you, a deep yearning, you know, a, a deep yearning for, um, that creates a kind of restlessness and gets us into this and gets us into that. And we do this for a while and we're like, we feel good about it or we don't feel good about it, but whatever it is, then it's over. And then you're kind of like, now what, you know, <laughs> and you're on to the next thing. But underneath that restlessness like that, that keeps us like moving on and doing stuff is I think there's a deep longing in every living being, I would say, not just people, to find your wholeness, to find your unitary, to, to, to loosen the bonds of separation because when you feel I'm separate, I'm just the separate person and I'm limited, I'm small, it's, it, you know, it, and the universe is big and I have to protect myself and I need to be afraid and I need to find where I'm safe. And it's, it, it's stressful. <laughs> it is. It gets overwhelming sometimes because you get these feelings, right? And you know, you've never done that. It's like you talked about the stove, right? Going to the stove, you might've burnt yourself, but that might've been in a past life. But it, your past life or so far back in your memory, you don't remember it. And you then know? you're like, I never burnt myself. So why am I scared of the stove? You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so we find these things and those might be big traumas, you know, even from a past life or from early life that we don't remember, or we've blocked out, you know, these things really affect how we, how we are. And so, um, yeah, this, the spiritual journey, as I see it is, is loosening those bondages so that we can be free to be the person we want to be and we can feel wholeness and work with this fundamental sense of separation so that we can feel our connectedness to everyone and everything. Matria, I want to, I want to get into some of the services that you offer and some of the teachings, because there's a lot of teachings that I, when I did my research and homework on you and on your book and that is I was like, I haven't heard of any of these teachings before. Uh, why, why, do I not hear these teachings? Uh, there was one that I found that was the feminine mag magist magicians. Am I saying that right? Feminine mysticism. Feminine yes. mysticism. Yeah. Say I that five times, right? That's a tongue twister in itself. <laughs> mysticism. Right. So could you tell me a little bit about that? Because I've never heard of that. Well, feminine mysticism is <clears throat> sort of working with the spiritual path for women specifically, <clears throat> and how we as women have our own way of approaching 
connectedness and wholeness, you know. We're, you, we bring life into the world. We, um, we may have more earth connection. We have, women tend to be very heart-centered and a lot, I mean, it's a very generalization. We're a big bell curve and we're all different, but, but in general, women, um, you know, according to studies are, are more, are better at connectedness, are better at, because you have to be connected to your children and take care of them and, and men. Are, so, so there's cultural and somewhat biological different roles that men and women play. And uh, so women in a way have their own mystical journey. And so for a lot of women who are very woman identified, it's, it's uh, very freeing to feel that there is a path, a, a mystical path for women, a way that women can sort of lean into their strengths as women with other women to open their spiritual self. Well, it's kind of like grounding with Mother Earth, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, above a certain level, we're, we're all, on, as spirit beings, we're all the same. And if you believe in reincarnation, some people may, you may reincarnate in one life as a man and another as a woman, right? You know, so, but, but on the physical level, there are differences. And, and um, sometimes uh, utilizing those differences to bring your spirit into harmony can be helpful. And so the path of feminine mysticism is, is about that, you know. And there's there's a lot of books on on it. They may not call it feminine mysticism. They call may call it many other things. But there's a lot of books about spirituality for women and a lot of teachings on that subject. Well, uh, uh, your books are called the Spiritual Life uh, series. So you have multiple books. On, yes, on I this. do. Um, the the first one is uh, this one into the oops where is it <laughs> in, into there we go. the into the heart of the infinite. And that one is, uh, that's my own personal journey. Cause sometimes I think we, we relate better to hearing stories of other people's journeys and we find the parts that resonate with us. And sometimes that's a better way of opening to spiritual life than just reading about ideas and um, so, so I've shared my story in this and my spiritual journey and what, what that has entailed and mystical experiences. So, um, you know, so that people can relate, find their own mystical experience uh, relating in the resonance with mine. The second book is Living Love, the Yoga of Yama Niyama. And oh. this is, yeah, this is the second book in the spiritual how to live a spiritual life series. And so what does that stand for? The Yuma not yeah, Yama. Well, they're part of the eightfold path of yoga. They're the Yama and Niyama are the kind of there are five Yamas and five Niyamas. And they're the kind of um yogi, it's they're called the yogic ethical principles, but really what they are, um, if you really look into them and how they operate, they're they're ways to make your life and the way you are in the world align with spirit so that you can uh, go deeper. So, for example, and some of them are things you've known of, Ahimsa, which was used by Martin Luther King and Gandhi, right? They were very into Ahimsa, which is the nonviolence. And so that's you know, to do the least amount of harm that you can in the world to try to live with not doing harm. And it can be applied socially. It can be applied in your individual life. But it's a motto when you live that, you know, we, we all do harm. Uh, you, you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> if nothing else. I am so glad you said that. 
<laughs> you know, there is no perfection on tea time. You know, we, we bring real raw stories to the table and, you know, we need to put that message out there that it's okay to be imperfect, you know, because Absolutely. we live in this, we live in a time where everyone wants to be perfect and they're not noticing the fails in them that are the main lessons that are pushing them onto a divine a experience and journey as well because i know i have to do that perfect i have to have this on time i have to do you know slow down because you're missing the actual journey of the fails and the falls and and the connections you know it's like picking those berries going back to the blueberries again i guess i, I need to go pick some blueberries but i'm going back to the berries and it's if you're looking at the whole pot and you're saying my 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 mind without focusing on that one berry and saying you know what oh it might be a little crooked it might be a little smaller than the rest but that's the one i gotta start with you know and that's how life is as well i couldn't agree with you more part of the spiritual journey is learning to really love who you are love your humanity as and and in loving your humanity and going deep in it feel your connection your you to the unitary whole because all beings suffer all beings have struggle and you're not unique in it it's 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 part of the life journey and teachings of of living in a body in this world you know <clears throat> and so it's it's part of being human and part of being human is recognizing the beauty of your connectedness through your humanity so I, I, I love that because, you know, we speak of humanity, but I don't think we actually understand humanity, that it starts with us and it ends with us. You know, if we want a better world and we want a better place, then it needs to start with us. We, we're, we're the ones that can do this, uh, you know, and I'm a strong believer in peace. But do I feel peace is going to be at this time? No, I don't, because we're not even understanding humanity anymore. In today's world we're so busy and so i gotta get this i gotta get this i gotta we want more 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 without even appreciating what we already have what's in us yes good message yes that's very true so the yamas and niyamas to get back to that they really uh that this book is about they oh, and i don't know how to do this <laughs> but, but <laughs> you, you got it <laughs> but the they they're really um yoga's avenue to living in the world in a way that, you know, it's not trying to achieve perfection, but it is trying to guide your mind. Like satya is truthfulness, right? Benevolent truthfulness. Uh, how can you be kindly truthful in the world and not only out with people, you know, okay, so you tell the truth most of the time, but do you tell the truth to yourself? You know? Bingo. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. You know, my listeners out there, you know how Miss Liz is about the truth. And the truth hurts because nothing grows in comfort. And even our spiritual journey, as you're sharing, Matria, like, it hurts. It's not a, a it, it, The cuts and scars need to be there in order for us to have our story. If you Absolutely. don't have those cuts and scars, you can't. What journey do you have? It shows that you just existed. You didn't live, you know, and we need to start living within ourselves. What you said, that you just existed, you didn't live. Living life is living the fullness of life. And, and coming, you know, working with, like we called about the karma, the, the subconscious mind, working with that is, you know, they say in the yoga path that, um, something called Vera, courage is needed. Um, you know, everyone says, oh, meditation is so wonderful. It's going to bring you peace. It's going to bring you calm. Well, that's true. But then as you get peaceful, as you get calm, uh, the subconscious mind begins to bleed into the conscious mind and your karma starts coming up. And it requires courage to be on the spiritual path and to face your shadow and to work with your shadow 
to find the deep love for yourself and for all beings, to find the deep compassion for yourself, for your faults and failings, and for others, for their faults and failings, that requires um, courage to face the inner demons. Uh, and that that courage, that vera, is, is something that um, is essential. And there, there's a big stage of this. First, you get into spirituality. You learn to meditate and to feel calm. And, oh, I feel so good. I'm relaxing. And then you start to, <laughs> you know, they don't usually put this on the beginner's note on meditation. But then you start to, <laughs> yeah, then, then you start to begin to feel yourself. And then you work through that karma. And then you come to the divya stage of meditation, the, the divine stage of meditation, where you begin to feel this connectedness to the whole. You begin to feel that unitary whole, this, uh, that bliss being comes into your yourself. And you begin to realize that under all this struggle and everything, you have an immense, beautiful fantastic divine nature that is connected to God, that is part of God, that the whole thing is part of God, in fact, and the struggle and everything is part of the journey home. You know, well, Matri and Matri, I want to, I want to take you on a journey because I asked you to give me one word to describe yourself and your word was whole. And we're talking about being whole within ourselves. So why that word for yourself? I don't know why I chose that word, but I think whole to me means um, integration, body, mind, and spirit integration, and connecting to the divine whole. That when you're connected to that, you're not just this body, you're not just this mind, you're part of something larger, you're part of a whole of being. And I think that whole of being, that, that love which is eternal, which is the God consciousness, which is the, the one unitary whole of being. Uh, that's, that's what I love. That's where my heart lies. <laughs> I really love that you gave me that word because when I, when I was doing my homework on you, uh, Matria, I, I could see the whole in your work, in your teachings, in your, even your platforms, the way that you speak, you know, it all comes together. It's all whole. It's all one big piece, uh, you know, so you can see the inner work that has been done over the years and through, through the work that you do. Uh, so I, I, that's why I wanted to go and take you onto a little journey. Cause sometimes, you know, we have to take the guest onto a little journey and see why they give me these words. Um, but when I when I did my work on you, uh, Matria, I, I I seen the whole, and I wanted to understand the whole, and I just like to take my guests on a journey sometimes as well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of incredible work that you do, and you've been doing this for a long time. Um, you do retreats and all that. So if anybody would like to join retreats or anything like that, when you Matria or get your books or anything like that, where can they get? get they, can that? Go my, they can go to my website, which is yogama.org. Yogama, Y-O-G-A-M-A.org. You can go to my website. You can also go to my YouTube where a lot of my talks are put onto the YouTube channel. Uh, which is at babatalks.info, um, is my YouTube. Uh, no, that's my, babatalks.info is my podcast. Of a, and then I don't know what the YouTube is called. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's my tree something or other, my tree 77, or I don't know. <laughs> well, we're going to get everybody over to the right places. It'll be in the description box when you, when you check out this tea time, but I just wanted to take you on that journey for a minute. You know, uh, sometimes we get so busy in, in the thought process that sometimes we just need to pause. Right. Um, 
And you were talking about the hole, and it, I just found that that was the perfect time to ask you about the word hole. So, you know, this is how it works with Miss Liz. And, you know, I get these little taps from my Oma on the back and say, okay, now it's that time to ask, you know. But now I want to get into your tea because you gave me teaching eternal awakening. Uh, I want to know why you gave me those three words. I think what is really in my heart, teaching is sharing knowledge and love. Eternal, what, what, is, what is there for me is eternal awakening. Awakening to the eternal consciousness, love, beingness that is our own self, that is yourself, that is myself, that is the self of all beings. It's the self of all these lovely plants I'm surrounded by, right? You know, it. nothing is outside of that divine presence. And uh, eternal awakening is, I think, awakening to the eternal, awakening to that which is not limited. These bodies come, they last for a while, and they go we're all going to leave this world sooner or later in these bodies. But what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing? What is, what is life about? Right. You know, why are we here? And, and I think that we're here to find our eternal nature, to find our connectedness to, I think this, our life is an opportunity to find love to f not love like I love you because you love me, not transactional love. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I think the word love is overrated. You know, <laughs> a lot of people use it without even understanding how deep it is. It, it's like the divine energy and universe. It is so deep that we speak of it, but we do we truly understand it? And I think until we become whole, like you said, Matria, you know, we're not going to. And that's why we have these lessons and these journeys and these spiritual teachers like yourself out there to teach us and to let us understand it because maybe we don't know it and we need to take the lessons and we need to take the webinars to understand it. Or maybe we're afraid of it. Uh, you know, uh, it goes right back to reincarnation. How many people actually believe in reincarnation? Not everybody does. Uh, you know, I do. I believe my last life will be a cricket. I, I, I have visions of being a cricket in my last life. So I don't know why, but that's who I'm going to be. And, you know, but I think we're not listening to the whole. We're not listening to within ourselves because we're so full of what's out there that's keeping us distracted from the end. Yes, exactly. We get distracted. And that's where meditation comes in as a practice to just find a methodology to quiet the mind, to um, focus on the l love, not love and transactional love, but the love like you're talking about, the eternal love, which is part of the nature of our own being. It is the nature. I mean, to me, it's the closest word we have to the nature of our own being, you know, which is uh, this infinite wholeness, this this seamless wholeness of being this this it's a fulfillment of who we are it's like each of us is a little embodied piece of divinity and we have this wonderful opportunity in life to open that little piece and melt back into the whole and to find that we've never been separate we are whole that that's our our nat that's our natural state of being. So and, Andrea, we, we have a question here. Yeah. Why do, why do you think the universe has caused distractions? <laughs> that's one of those universal unanswerable questions. <laughs> right? Uh, well, well, the distraction, I don't feel it comes from the universe. I find that that's an outside of the universe. The, well... I think it's all within the whole. The the dark and the light, the shadow and the light are all within consciousness of being, within the manifestation of divine presence, 
divide into form and into the colors and forms of this mass expression. And, you know, they say in yoga, they say it's a dance. It's a Leela. It's a dance. It's a, it's a play. Uh, who knows? Maybe it's just for fun. <laughs> You know, who knows? We need to play more. I, I, I just said this yesterday. We need to play, right? It's like the life, of, the roller coaster in life, right? We need to go up. We need to go down. We need to enjoy the journey that's within us, uh, you know, and finding that wholeness. And I think we all can if we just pause and take the time to look within ourselves. You know, we're so distracted with you did this and you did that and you can fix this. And you, you, you. How about you fix me? Fix yourself, like fix within, you know, uh, because we all have those faults. Like you said a few minutes ago, Matria, like, you know, we're not perfect. We're imperfect. And I think our spiritual journeys are what actually is our life lessons and blessings, uh, you know. And it's like you said, living and if we take them, if we take them to be our journey and the things that are hard, we take as lessons and we grow and we learn from it and we take it as opportunity to open deeper, sometimes pain and real struggle and real loss is what opens people's deepest potential. You know, the, the journey is not always one of love and light. And I just kind of go higher and higher and higher. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily like that. And, and some of, you know, sometimes being in that raw challenge to the core of your being and you're in that critical crisis moment is what triggers transformation. And, and the spiritual path is the process of transformation, of moving from one level of awareness to another level of awareness, moving from like a two-dimensional flat awareness. Oh, there's a tree. It's just a thing in front of me, right? You know, to, wow, there's this living being. It has this bark. It has these, these leaves. It has this, you know, it has fluids running. Oh, the tree feels like this about being in life. And it's a shelter for all the little beings around it, including me. And you know, and then, wow, that which is in the tree is the same as that which is in me, you know, and, and discovering I'm connected. I'm connected to the tree. This is a, a vital life around me that I'm connected to. And, and so we have an opportunity to go there or to stay very flat. And sometimes we just keep doing what we've been doing until something happens to kick us out of it. And sometimes that's something pretty intense. It's not always that way. We all have a different journey to follow, but sometimes it can be painful. It can be something that rips you open to the core so that you can, you start reevaluating who you are and what is. I really like that you use the tree for an example, Matria, because it's connecting to the Mother Earth, right? The roots of the tree. When you look at a tree and the branches are all like crick and crack, I always wonder what journey did that tree go through? What storm did it survive through? Uh, you know, how many rainstorms did it get? Like winter storms and summer and the heat and how it cracks. And, I, you know, I, I, I think we need to really look at trees as a way of life as well because it looks the tree is within us you know how our branches how our steps how we overcome our storms and challenges in life and that but it goes right back to the mother earth right it's that connection of grounding yourself and rooting yourself back to to life and right now we have so many people that are living just in existence that are not actually living and then when it comes to a point where they're told well, your life is almost over, then they're like, oh, but I didn't live yet, you know? So let's start getting where we can live within the whole before it's too late and say, oh, well, I would like an extra 10 years instead of 10 days, you know? Well, part of that, I think, is really 
embracing courage, embracing your courage, your courage to face your shadows and your demons and to learn to love yourself and to learn to find the beauty in what is. And, and that path takes courage. It's, it's because I think it's often fear, you know, what you're talking about where people are running away and they're just getting unconscious and they're just sort of living, you know, very um, unconsciously in life. It's out of fear. It's, well, it goes it's, back to the it goes back to the first question we had at the beginning of the show, right? Is why do we fear our consciousness? Uh, you know, is it really fear, or is it, you know, some outsource that is telling that 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 it is fear because it's confusing? We might not understand it. We might not understand the journey that we need to take. Uh, because we have so many outsources telling us, no, you need to do it this way, you need to do it this way, you know, but our within is saying, no, this is not, it's that intuition, the gut feeling, you know, that something's off, that we're not listening to, we're just like, ah, it's just a little butterfly, we can get over this. And I yeah. think that's where it comes, right, is the wholeness within ourselves is scaring a lot of us, because we're like, well, is it that simple? Is it that easy? But we try to confuse it, right? We kind of go on to a different path and we're like, no, this is where we need to go. And then we're like, oh, I should have never did that five years ago. You yeah. know, I could have went to the left side instead of the right side. And I think that's what spiritual journey is all about as well, right? Is opening those eyes and being awakened and understanding the eternal. Because I think we don't understand the eternal. And I think we need guidance and teachers like you, Matria, to teach us these, these awakenings. Um, so what has your teachings taught you about your journey? Well, that's what I go into and in, into the heart of the infinite. It's just, um, it, I, I got a great deal of guidance from my outer guru and I got a great deal of guidance. Really. Uh, I later met my inner guru, um, and I met my guru first within and then met the physical person in India, but I met the guru within first. And that guru still remains as a, as a guiding presence in my life and had, has taught me and guided me. And so I've received this divine grace of guidance. And when I give the Baba talks, I, I just sort of melt into that. And then I allow that, um, flow you know they're not anything i think about it's sort of a flow from i don't think it's another being i think it's higher consciousness embodying and um flowing through and so uh, when i give the baba talks the talks are not from my own thinking but from that sort of higher consciousness that i call baba uh and on that level, Baba means beloved, means father. A lot of teachers, gurus in India are called Baba, male gurus. But my my guru, my physical guru, Baba, I felt was an embodiment of that divine consciousness. He had that divine, he had connected to it. And then I had the inner connection with my inner Baba. And I feel that in the inner guru, I have been taught and I have been given the grace of infinite love, you know, and uh, I'm forever grateful. And um, that teaching, that guidance has brought me to opening up to the, the wholeness of what is and the love that's there in all of us, in everyone. And so that's kind of how the journey has... Um, unfolded for me the way the divine has manifested for me. We all have our unique ways, but I think the main thing is if we open inside, and meditation really helps us with this, but if we open inside to divine presence in our lives and you just make space for that and say the wholeness of being, the divine consciousness, the divine presence, I'm here, I'm available. I'm I'm here for you, you know, and just open to that divine presence and notice that divine presence in whatever way it manifests in your life and cultivate that manifestation by 
connecting in that harmony and love, cultivating love for yourself and for all beings and for kindness and compassion to all beings and deep honesty with yourself. Cultivate that love and that relationship you have to divine being. I think we each can do that, but it's a, it's, it is, each of us has our own personal unique path within. And the meditative practices can help you to quiet the mind and open that space. But it's also just being available, if that makes sense to you. Making it available. Well, it's quieting the mind, right? Being present with yourself and giving your time to yourself to be whole. You know, whether it's five minutes or it's five five hours or five days, just take that time for yourself. We're not taking that time for ourselves, uh, you know. And I really want to just thank you for bringing this to the table tonight and having this open conversation because these are conversations we need more of, you know. Being uh, real, I, being real with ourselves. <laughs> These are great conversations. <laughs> and I feel that we need to open the doors to be whole. Uh, you know, and if we don't know about the wholeness within ourselves and the divine energy and eternal awakening, how can we move forward? How can we move past the scars and that? And and it goes right back to that the comment of reincarnation scars. You know, it passes through the next life and the next life. If we don't handle it now in the moment, it gets carried on to the next life. Also, it gets carried on generationally down. You know, the traumas of, of the get carried on through the generations as well as through your own karmic pattern. So it's best to, best to be with it. And the only way to really be with it is with deep, deep love and compassion and kindness for yourself so what final message do you have for everybody tonight love yourself open up to divine source open up to finding that love in you and all around you and cultivating your connection to the whole, cultivating your deep soul connectedness. Open up to it. Do whatever practices you need to do, whatever meditations, but mostly open your heart, open your, open your mind and notice divine presence around you and let go. Let go and trust. Well, I really want to thank you for joining me and sharing this open conversation with my listeners out there. Uh, and I want to thank all of my listeners for tuning in and, you know, sending your questions and your comments and your quotes. I, I really do appreciate those as well because it brings a deeper conversation with my guests when you take part and you ask those questions because I myself learn as you learn uh, with my guests and my guests learn sometimes from all of my listeners as well. So thank you for that. Um, you know, this year has been really a spiritual journey for Miss Liz and for my guests. And you'll see that in all the upcoming guests. There's a lot of spiritual walking that we'll be doing this year uh, together. And let's hope that we can open that wholeness and bring a difference. Uh, Matria, I want to, uh, for anybody that would like to know more about you, again, read out your um, your e uh, your website and spell it out for the audio listeners, and yeah. we'll get you out there for everybody. Okay, it's mytrema.org. Or, or no, I'm sorry, it's yogama.org. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Yoga, it used to be my website, yogama.org. It's y o g a m a dot org. O R G, yoga ma dot org. Well, thank you so much. And before we let you go, we're just going to say thank you again. And 
if you have any upcoming uh, events or retreats that you'd like to get out before we wrap up, uh, you could share that now as well. Well, I have a Saturday morning satsang that I do uh, once a month. And I also have, we have a meditation that we do on Monday mornings. Um, and you're welcome to come to that. And I will be soon doing some more uh, webinars. But for now, the Saturday morning satsang is there. And uh, you're welcome to write to me, join, join my mailing list, I'll get on my mailing list. I have a monthly newsletter which goes out to everyone and there's spiritual teachings in it and uh, events and everything. So uh, sign up for my newsletter and stay connected. Well, thank you so much. And I'll see everybody on August 5th with a rescheduled tea time. Fern Brady will be in the house and she'll be sharing her books and inkling publishing. We're going to talk about that and all that good stuff. And then on the 7th, we have two other guests that are coming in with their TEA. So check out Miss Liz's Facebook page uh, and the press releases that are on all social media platforms. And you can see the lineup that we're going to be having this month in August. And thank you, Matria, for starting off August. You are my first guest of August 2024. So thank you for that. Oh, and I will see everybody on the 5th at 3. 7 p.m. with Fern Brady. We are doing an evening tea time. So until then, keep serving your teas, keep being true to yourself, and let's make a difference one cup of tea at a time. Okay. Wonderful to be here. <laughs>